Hey, welcome to another episode of Inside DevOps. I'm your host, John Bristow, and joining me today is Thomas Lee. Thomas Lee is an IT uh, industry veteran of over 40 years. His, his hair is almost as gray as mine. Uh, he's been involved in Microsoft products since the very beginning of the IBM PC and DOS. Uh, Thomas provides consultancy and training around a wide range of products, uh, Microsoft products, including PowerShell and Link Server. And he's been a Microsoft MVP for 17 of the past 18 years and runs PowerShell training courses across Europe and around the world. He's been heavily involved in OCS and Link Ignite training on behalf of Microsoft for the past seven years, uh, several years. He's done a whole bunch of stuff speaking at conferences. I, you know, I won't bore you with this bio, but uh, he's done a lot of work with PowerShell. Anyone who's done anything with PowerShell would know about Thomas. Thomas, thank you for joining me on Inside DevOps. I appreciate your time. Uh, really glad to be here. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. So I want to start off by kind of going way back. The year is 2003. Uh, for those folks who probably weren't born then, 2003 was, you know, an interesting year. We had a lot of great things happen back then. Um, you know, this was well before uh, all the stuff that's happened recently. But, you know, back in the day we had, uh, well, the, uh, the Iraq war was on. Um, there was a whole bunch, I think, uh, who was in power? George Bush was in power uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, we had a. I think there was a lot of popular hits involving. Um, I commonly refer to Smash Mouth in the '90s, but um, 2003. I think that's like Blink 182. Anyways, and there's a little-known conference uh, taking place called the Professional Developers Conference, or PDC 2003. And at that conference, a gentleman by the name of John Snover walks up Jeffrey on stage. Snover. Sorry, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Snover. Sorry, Jeffrey Snover. Sorry, I'm thinking of my name now. Sorry, Jeffrey Snover walks up on stage and announces uh, a little thing called PowerShell. And where were you at the time? Well, so I got to go back 24 hours. Okay. Uh, I'd, go to the, I'd go to the PDC to represent one of the UK magazines. I was a writer. I, in spare time, I wrote for a variety of magazines. So I got a press pass, and I was at the press uh, viewing of that conference. The night before, a bunch of us went out to, to drink, and we went to this <laughs> bar in Hollywood. And the, the woman who was serving us, uh, now, of course, this is America. This is Hollywood. She was on okay. roller skates. Oh, and she's, well. got a tr she's got a tray of vodka shots and sushi. And she tried to convince me that if I had enough sushi, it would nullify the alcohol in the <laughs> vodka. If I had enough vodka, it would nullify all the carbs in the sushi. So I wake up unhungover and skinny. And clearly, I did not get the right balance. <laughs> So, so I, I, I go down to the, to the conference center, and I feel yes. dreadful. And any of your listeners out there have ever had a hangover, man, this was, this was, this was going to be a good one. So I, sure. figured, look, I, got not, I got nothing to do this morning. You know, just hang out. I got stuff this afternoon. So what I'll do is I'll find a really boring talk. I'll climb in the back and fall asleep for an hour. So I see bad scripting, what you can do in seven lines of code. I thought, that sounds pretty boring. Yep. And I went in and I found back next to the back row. I'm all by myself. And the group slowly fills up. And yep. anyway, I within about 30 seconds of Jeffrey standing up, my hangover's gone, and I'm into one of the most transformative talks I've ever attended in my professional career. At, at one at one minute, in, in one minute, he literally encapsulated all the things wrong with the GUI management of Windows Server. Right, and if you think about it, that was the time when Microsoft was trying to transition NT into being an enterprise, not a departmental yep. server. Now, NT four rocked as a departmental server. Yes, it did. But, yes, but not as an enterprise. You know, there were issues. Anyway, Windows two thousand came along with Windows uh, with uh, AD and so on, but you yep. still had the issue. How, how can you manage hundred thousand people with Active Directory users and computers? It just doesn't scale in that dimension. And, and he, 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 Snover pointed out that it doesn't scale. It's not auditable. It's not repeatable. It's not reliable. And I'm thinking like, okay, so what's the answer? And there it is, Monad. And I mm. took one look and I fell in love. That Right then, the hangover uh, disappeared. Instantly appeared, yeah. <laughs> and, and of course, now, now many, many of the people in the PowerShell community will know that I was the first venture capitalist behind PowerShell. I stood up at that end. I had a $20 bill and I said, I'll buy it now. I'll yes. buy it now. 
And Jeff, I'm not taking your money. Yeah, yeah, did, yeah. I, I eventually did give him that twenty dollar bill, which I kept for a long time, and he now carries it. Uh, if you ever see him, ask him; he'll he'll show you the bill. Uh, it was a, a long term commitment that he had to make this product great. He did, and I delivered. So I'm the first PowerShell VC. Wow, but I, fantastic! But I came back to England, and I was really excited about it. And I started I started talking to everybody who'd listen. Uh, I got involved with, I was working at, uh, full, full time for what was then Global Knowledge. Mm. And I convinced them to work, let me help write the first PowerShell training course. And how was that received? Did you, uh, have, to, did you have to pitch PowerShell just as much as Jeffrey? No, no. It was an easy pitch to sell. I was going to say. <laughs> the, the course itself, you know. It was the first course I'd been involved with with Global Knowledge, and there's a lot of things we could have done better. Um, I and then Don Jones took it over. He got the contract to rewrite it. Did an excellent job, uh, and uh, I've been teaching it ever since until the uh, they finally uh, moved the course off to where I can't teach it anymore. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that uh, that you were so enamored with PowerShell the first time you saw it. I I actually caught this tweet. I don't know if you saw it from Jeffrey, where he said. You know, when you I, when I was doing the prototype of what became PowerShell, he tweeted this about nine months ago. He said, a friend cautioned me saying that that was the sort of thing that got people fired. And then he said he went on to say, I didn't get fired. I got demoted. This was something that yeah. was really interesting that for me to read is that he got he potentially got he got demoted over this. And it wasn't until it became he became a distinguished engineer at Microsoft that he actually was had had basically enough. He wasn't didn't feel embarrassed to talk about this anymore, which is really surprising to me for such a transformative technology like PowerShell. But what what are your thoughts about this? Like, did, have you well, seen this tweet before? I, I know the backstory. Yeah, I know it very well. Uh, basically, when G Jeffrey produced the Monad Manifesto, which uh, if you've ever read that that document, it, it, it's it's just it's complete a beautiful document encapsulating the issues and the challenges and the answer at that time. And he didn't have, he, he wanted to lead the team. And so his boss's boss said, look, thing is, you're too high of a grade. I, I, I can't let you do it. And so Jeffrey said, right, what do I got to do to do that? So a number got pushed over and Jeff said, done. So he, he, he it wasn't so much he got demoted. He, he get, got the chance to run the team and yep. took, what, took the price. And uh, that's what, made me respect Jeffrey even more than anything he'd done previously. You know, there's the document. That, that, that is just completely, um, completely blew my mind when I read that. I uh, remember right. reading it on the, tr on the plane back to, to London. Uh, I'd had it printed out. I read it a couple of times and just thought, such a great analysis. Now, some of the things that are in that Mount Ed Manifesto never quite came true. Uh, one of the things that I really wish we'd been able to have is all the GUIs when you did something could spit out the PowerShell commands to do that. Right. Uh, that was one so, of the, the, the that was one of the things that was kind of promised, and it never really materialized. Sadly, uh, a few of the MMCs, the Exchange one, for example, early yes. one, did spit. Oh out, yeah, and that was yeah, great. they were fantastic. Oh, they were fantastic. I remember when that all came out. The whole MMC movement came out. I was like, finally, finally, we're going to have a, a good management console. And uh, be able to take get some semblance and sanity around our, our the all these application servers we're running. Well, I, I I interviewed for the magazine, which we didn't publish for, for, for space reasons. But I interviewed the the uh, uh, MMC lead for the Exchange team, and he he said to me that yeah, of course of course they're going to use PowerShell. It's perfectly obvious. And he said, so how would you create a new mailbox? He said. I said, well, I type new mailbox. So he typed new mailbox, and it did. And how would you delete a mailbox? Well, get mailbox, pipe, remove mailbox. Yep. It works. So I already knew, even though I didn't know change, I already knew how to uh, how to manage bits of it. And that just really excited me to, to think that IT pros could could do the easy stuff really easy. And then, <laughs> and then if you remember the old exchange MMC, it yep. had about 87 levels of, of menu. Find something. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, which of a hundred, ah, it was just horrendous. And suddenly, now, admittedly, the first exchange MMC, they didn't quite get it right in the sense mm. that they took a little bit too much out. 
But SP1 fixed that. And uh, 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 the balance was restored to the point where the average admin can use the MMC. Fine, that, that works, you know, for just adding a simple mailbox, Billy or Bobby or whatever could do that. Or yep. then, then for the more difficult things uh, and the more depth things, rather than having to fight through the UI, you could you fight through PowerShell. And, and it, just, it just made so much sense. You've been involved in this space for a while. Like like I said in your bio and introduction there, you've been writing books, you've been doing plural site yeah. courses, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you, you've written a book here, and this is part of the reason why I reached out because I wanted to chat with you. You've written a book here called uh, Windows Server Automation with PowerShell. This is the fifth edition of this book. Um, yeah. Incidentally, I did want to ask you, you, you have written books in the past, and there's one here that yeah. retails for $400. This is quite a this is quite a beefy uh, book you've got here, TCP IP blueprints for four hundred dollars. That is a four hundred dollar book, there, sir. So 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 two two things about the about TCP IP. I've always loved TCP IP. I I, I early in my career I almost got onto the networking team. Uh, they they I didn't, but I always liked the idea of these network protocols and these things passing back and forth. And yep. Um, I wanted to learn TCP IP. I thought this was going to be something coming with Windows 2000 in the future would probably be useful. Uh, I, I knew that eventually we'd get to TCP. So I, I bought a book. Um, now, I tried to buy a book, Richard Stevens, TCP IP. Uh, it's a Unix book, but I couldn't get it in the UK. Just couldn't find it. And on my way to get married to my wife, we stopped in LA and I went to the LA bookshop and my brother, University of Los Angeles, uh, uh, got me in, and I got a copy of the book. So I took the book on honeymoon. It's a true story. And every night, as my wife did her, um, you know, her evening, getting herself ready, uh, yep. I'd read a chapter of the book. So on honeymoon, I read a TCP/IP book, and I was so excited. And when I came back, uh, I've been doing a lot of writing on Usenet, and I got the the uh, editors. Uh, those nice people uh, at, uh, who were they, Sam's, reached out and said, we're desperate. We need a couple of chapters. Um, can you help? So yep. I, I met up with the, the uh, uh, over the, the net with uh, the authors. And yeah, I wrote, wrote a couple of chapters and really enjoyed it. But then I realized that actually what we really needed, and this is going back to the late 80s, late 90s rather, what we really needed was a book. What I wanted to do with Stevens for Windows if that makes sense. Uh, that, that was my pitch line. And um, I had I'd been uh, uh, posted to come to work for Microsoft, uh, at Microsoft Learning, on the yep. Windows 2000 courseware. And I got this email from an, a commissioning editor saying, you know, hello, this is me. We're looking for books. We understand you do a bit of writing. Why don't yep. you come talk to me? So I picked up the phone and I called. And of course, I'm on campus. I'm in building 10. She's in building <laughs> think 18, but I could be wrong. And hello, I said, hi, it's Thomas Lee. And there's a silence. Wow, that was quick. But but you're from inside. Yeah, I'm here in Redmond. So that day we had lunch. I told her what I wanted to do. She said, sure. So she put me together with Joe Davies. And Joe, Joe and I had worked on an internal PSS course on TCP IP. And uh, I got to deliver it around, around Europe. So I went back and I said to, I said to, 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 to Ann Hamilton, what we need to do is take that course and convert it into writing. And that would be a great, um, a great book. So we did. And it's the book that's made me the most amount of money of all of them just about put together. Uh, it it yeah. really hit at a great time. I must have sold 30, 35,000 copies. It's it's a monster of a book, and and I'm 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 imagining that you're probably buying it on a per page basis at a dollar a page here in Australia. Well, <laughs> no, I, I got it priced at. <laughs> well, John, I, I'd like to think that uh, you know the, the rare books by great authors like me are such such rare. You know, it's, it's <laughs> obvious it's worth that. Of now, course. But, uh, but uh, yeah, so back back to the PowerShell book, uh, you know. Uh, that, that, that's been a fun book to work with. As, as you said, it's the fifth edition. The first edition uh, was not great. That was the, done by somebody else. And they asked me, could I redo it? So I've done now three editions of that. Uh, and the, the last edition, the, sorry, the penultimate edition that I did, the fourth edition, uh, we launched at a bad time, didn't have a great title, and was... 
kind of pitched at the wrong level at the wrong time. And a mistake that any budding author will learn to realize, sadly, in my case, after the fact. <laughs> so they said, look, let, let's just chuck that book and create a new one. And, and so here it is. <coughs> and I know we're going to get into things we can do and can't do with PowerShell, but yep. one of the yep. things we didn't do with Windows, sorry, with PowerShell 7 was use some of the older modules. So in this book, one of the things I did on a whole chapter on uh, managing uh, WSUS with PowerShell 7. Now, you may say, yeah, okay, so what? Well, because I can't run the WSUS module in PowerShell 7, it doesn't run in the compatibility uh, solution either. I had to do it using a remoting technique. And so it's a little bit long-winded, but it just mm. shows you how you can do pretty much anything with PowerShell 7, uh, even using completely incompatible modules like the WSUS module. Mm. That's good. Yeah, fun. that's interesting. So we might we might as well get into into the into sure. the crux of what we wanted to talk about, which Absolutely. is PowerShell Seven. So PowerShell, um, uh, incidentally, my my I've been tracking PowerShell for a long time. I remember when it was first announced, and I was working at Microsoft, and yada yada. I, I run Mac now, but I still have PowerShell yeah. installed. And uh, because it's available via homebrew and, you know, don't hold that against me, but there you go. So um, PowerShell, I love because it was the first it was the first environment where you could actually pipe objects, which I actually absolutely loved. And the fact that commandlets were based in .NET and all that stuff was just it hit every it ticked off every box for me. Um, but in terms of PowerShell 7, I know this is a bit of a softball, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, what would you say is your favorite feature in PowerShell 7? Boy, that's a hard question. Okay, um, <laughs> maybe I, not I, a softball, I, maybe a fastball. I, 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 well, I, I, I think there are so many great things. I, I think, mm. for me, the greatest feature is that it exists as an open source product. Yes. And, and that, to your readers who don't, or listeners who may not understand, that has caused a huge challenge for the Microsoft team. I mean, I hate to think of the lawyer time that's been spent on that. Uh, just getting the I's dotted, the T's crossed so legals happen. But the fact that it exists is open source, that we can actually go and, and you can put issues up. And, and people like me help the team uh, actually guide them to what we're going to do next. And I, I think this public, uh, this uh, open source is, 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 is not so much a feature, but a, an attitude. Now, unfortunately, with the move to open source and to the move to opensource.net, that's meant some challenges. And, and there really are are kind of twofold challenges. First, the .NET team, for better or for worse, decided to take some APIs forward from Windows uh, uh, .NET framework, uh, and some they didn't. So in the case of WSUS, there's a whole bunch of APIs that .NET just did. Sorry, excuse me, that the .NET framework just did that .NET doesn't, which yeah. means that that code just cannot run on the, on the, the open source .NET. So they, a few of us, and probably me being the loudest screecher, said this is just, this is not good. You got hundreds of, of commandments that aren't going to run. There's got to be a better way to do this. Oh, well, you can use remoting manually. I say, no, no, that, that just doesn't cut it. So the, the team came up with this compatibility mechanism, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And basically what they do is they create a Windows PowerShell remoting session. They load the module in the remoting session, mm -hmm. then use implicit remoting to create a, 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 a script module in your PowerShell 7 uh, run space, which works almost everything just fine. Um, if I use get Windows feature, I don't get the display XML automatically loaded. You know, it, so it doesn't look pretty, but it works. Yes. So so the, 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 the challenges were how to get everything I wanted to be able to do in Windows PowerShell to be done in PowerShell 7. And so going into 7.0, uh, a big feature of 7.0 was the compatibility. I think they did a very good job. When yep. you look through my book, uh, the uh, latest uh, PowerShell book, uh, none of those modules are loaded by the compatibility, but you just wouldn't know it. Uh, the, about the only real problem challenge that I found was the display XML, but I found a way around that. I'm just manually loading the display XML when I needed it. 
Uh, but that still left three modules that just really didn't work real well. One was best practices, and the other was WSUS. And so, and I can't remember the third one, but it doesn't matter. Uh, but so we, there are ways you can, you can do things ar around that. Um, and if you look at the table of contents here, I see you're, you're, you're scrolling through it. Module 14, is chapter 14 there, managing Windows update services. What we do there is we do everything remote. So I, I make a remote call into a Windows PowerShell endpoint, do stuff there, and then we bring the answer back and it all works. Yeah, I took the liberty of looking at uh, your your repo there for the book uh, up on yeah. GitHub, and I saw a bit of the code examples there, so that was uh, great to see. Um, yeah, just I, a, a, I, a, a quick yeah, point. Uh, I have insisted for every book I've published that this stuff is, is GitHub. So all four of the books have all their scripts up on GitHub, um, and that's been great as, as a demonstration. Uh, so, yeah. Now, in order to write the book, I had to have a bunch of scripts for uh, managing uh, uh, the VMs. Now that, that this is the actual, that's the power. That's that's the previous book. Yeah, and you got your sorry, you got your res kit, uh, your res right, kit the, build okay, scripts okay, here the, as well. The, 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 the res, res kit build scripts; those are used to build the VMs. Yeah, and that runs on on Windows. If you go back to the my repo page, then the, the second of them. The packet PS2, down, down, down. Nope, oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, that one is the uh, the latest. And that gotcha. and that just has the scripts. So all the scripts are there. Uh, you can read them and please use them. Uh, if you find a mistake, mea culpa. You, you can't label a folder goodies and not get attention. Like, I'm going to skip all these chapters, immediately go to goodies, because I'm always about okay. the, the advanced tips and tricks. So. Okay, so what I did here was uh, in, in building PowerShell, the first chapter of the book is installing PowerShell 7. Yes. Remembering that PowerShell 7 does not load by default. So, uh, of course, some of the things I need to do are to have a decent profile. So I've got two sample profiles. As a starting point, they're great, but if you don't like them, you can, you can change them. And I show you uh, in, the, in the scripts in the book, uh, we actually use these goodies to bring back. Uh, so this is a, a sample uh, uh, profile. You know, you, you, I, I create, a, have a folder and yep. uh, I set some, I set some colors and you know yep. all the things you might want to do as, as as an example of a rich uh, a profile. And I also have a couple other things. Uh, as I get later in the book, I, I introduce new VMs. So rather than having to run the full chapter one scripts on every machine, I have two set up PS1 uh, uh, scripts there, which will do all the setup on later VMs. So I don't have to go through all the, the lower level uh, functions. And so that, that will just quickly, the first bit puts PowerShell on, the second part puts VS code and brings in uh, the Cascadia code uh, font. Gotcha. And there's, um, there's before... other things there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, and also, uh, in the book, uh, I have a showing how to... One of the biggest questions I got early on in, 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 in on PowerShell was, how do I add users using a CSV? So mm -hmm. I show you, there's a chapter, but to help you, I actually have the CSV built for you uh, in the goodies folder. Speaking of uh, VS Code, um, had you used uh, VS Code prior to, uh, I guess, the, I, I don't know what you call it, like the, uh, when PowerShell 6 came out, obviously the I, uh, ICS, or I, sorry, yeah, I ISC, yeah, uh, went away. Um, and then uh, and then everyone just defaulted to, to VS Code, basically. Were you used so to text the, editors? Well, I've been using text editors since the late 60s. Right? So but I, a VS Code I, I, one, like experience, et cetera? No, or? no well. Well, when, when the, the, the notion came to PowerShell 6, um, mm. I realized I couldn't manage PowerShell 6 with ISC. Yep. And the ISC, was, I was just very comfortable with. But I did start with VS Code early on, and those first few versions were pretty ropey. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, you know, this is the thing about, about progress, is that uh, you start off and it's just not very good. And every release got better, and better and better. And finally, there came a point 
at which I said, yeah, okay, this is, this is good enough. And I moved over and it's gotten just incre incrementally better since then. And now I couldn't do without it. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think, I, I think I, the extension experience is fantastic. Like I, I, I have it installed on, on my machine and, uh, the IntelliSense and the syntax highlighting and everything that's built in there, the integrated terminal, everything you could possibly want is, is right there at your fingertips. And uh, it's a right. wonderful environment. I, I, I strongly recommend it. When I was teaching Windows PowerShell uh, to the Microsoft crowd, I would show VS Code and a lot of mm -hmm. the, I would spend a lot of time using it. Yep. And yep. Uh, you know, it, it was just, it's just so natural to me. It, mm. uh, I, I love the product now, although it wasn't always love. It, it's gotten so much better. Every release just gets better and better. And now mm. you've got things like draw.io built in. So I don't need, I don't need uh, uh, PowerPoint quite so much. Yep. Uh, you've got uh, uh, markdown editing built in. So a lot of the, a lot of the work that uh, if you see the markdown files in my repos were all done with VS code. Uh, yeah. It's a marvelous tool. Yeah. Um, we were talking a little bit about favorite features with uh, PowerShell 7. Um, I was going to say that, like, there's some niceties that have come along for the ride. Like, I, I, I kind of expected him to be there because I had walked away from PowerShell around V5-ish. And I had gone to Bash because I was doing a lot of Bash scripting. And then I came back to it. And I realized in, in 7, there was, like, am I, re am I understanding this correctly? That, that things like um, pipeline chain commands, like, you know, the double ampersand, et cetera, were, were introduced in 7. Was, I can't correct, remember or? exactly which which build they were in. I yeah. think there was seven one, but yeah, uh, sorry, my memory of exact feature and date. Like, yes, the seven X is yeah. the, the chain operator, the pipeline chain. Uh, but to yeah. me, the, the best the best of all is the for each parallel. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. For for your run spaces. Yeah. Now, yeah. if you think about it, uh, there are a lot of operations that you might want to do. So one of the things that I do is I have a little script that goes through all my VMs and just does a few checks, does sure. a few things to them, uh, runs some Windows updates on them, and then and then stops. Well, that takes five or 10 minutes per machine. Windows update is not exactly fast. So <laughs> if I've got 15 machines, yep. well, so what I do is I do it for each parallel. And on my, my machine here, I've got 16, 16 cores, uh, Sorry, two dual processors, each with 16 cores. So I've got 32 cores, 64 virtual cores. So I can run 30 of but these. who's bragging, right? Time. Who's bragging? <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's, it, the, got, it's the old joke. Uh, sorry, it's the old joke. My a buddy of mine, Richard Campbell, used to say, like, uh, Microsoft Outlook is is has got uh, 100 threads running, and none of them are yours. And it's like, all right. So, um, but in the case of uh, for, for the parallel aspect of, of PowerShell 7 is fantastic because I would imagine that that update script, what got cut down in half, I would imagine. Well, no, no. I mean, if you think it took about 15 minutes per machine. So all of them took about 20 minutes. Oh. Because because I could run almost all of them in parallel. Yeah, yeah. And had enough. Now, admittedly, I have a very large machine. Dual mm -hmm. processor, sixteen core. Okay, got, okay, we get it. You got a, you got a great machine. <laughs> you don't have to rub it in. <laughs> One hundred twenty-eight gig of RAM, baby. Okay, okay, and, we get it. <laughs> and, and all and all SSD, so it's very quick. And so yes. what you're seeing there, I mean, I mean, admittedly, the machine is pegged. You know, it's absolutely flat out. But yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I I can do it in real time so much faster. And to me, that that becomes very natural. That, that's one yeah. of the great features. Yeah, I would agree. I, I like that. I identified that one really early on as well. I thought this is going to be good for a lot of reasons. Um, the, uh, go ahead. The other was the compatibility feature. And yeah. I think I think Steve Lee's done a great job there of, of hiding the Windows PowerShell stuff, but allowing you to use it in a very transparent way. So you just, you just get Windows feature and it does. And you don't have to worry about loading it manually the the early pre 70 uh, in fact we uh, the, the, the original uh, approach was you can do it all yourself in remote so I who wants to do who wants to do that like i'm I, I i mean i i did my fair share of remoting interfaces back in the day i even did like a lot of p invoke stuff after a <sighs> while you're like i don't want to do this anymore this is like this is like way too low level i don't want to do this so so the the the, the compatibility uh, scheme basically allows me to use all but three 
uh, of the modules, the Windows mm -hmm. Server modules, just fine. And a lot of other third-party modules. And, yep. it, and it works. It's yep. perfect now. But then, you know, perfection is the enemy of the good. Yes. Uh, and and I, I think, is it good enough for IT pros to use every day? Yep. Now, if there are issues like display XML that you need to worry about, well, you can create your own proxy functions that actually inst install the XML for you. Um, it's not that big of a deal. But yeah, I, I really like that feature. And it, unfortunately, the downside <coughs> is it's given the Windows team a pass of fixing all their incompatible modules. <laughs> Uh, I've given Jeff Woolsey a real hard time about this. Every time he, he every time he, he tweets blah blah blah, I say, "What about PowerShell?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, one of the I things th that I, I, Jeff, I go ahead. I think, I think Jeff's going to be glad to see me retired. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, one of the ones that I I don't know if you've had a chance to play around with secret management, but I absolutely love this. So I I do a lot of work with uh, vaults and with credentials, and as you know. When you're running scripts, um, the last thing you want to do is like because we sort we check these into source control, et cetera, et cetera. You want to make sure that those are represented as variables, et cetera, and you want to propagate those secrets carefully. And so this was something that I noticed a couple of years ago with the the integration through the secret management module. I absolutely love this. Now I know this isn't necessarily PowerShell seven, although it is it is compatible with PowerShell five point one. Um, but in seven, like they, you know, they recommend using seven, but the, the integration they have here with like one password and last pass and HashiCorp and all the so, other providers is fantastic. So a few things, first of all, uh, if you look at the PowerShell community blog, uh, I, I helped kick that off and I've written a blog post on that blog about these two modules. Yeah. I think these are great. I, you know, one of the, uh, one of the, 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 I think it's Snover's third law says to ship is to choose. And I chose not to use this module in my last book. And I wish I, that was a mistake. Oh, and there you go. I, I should have, I should have added this module to the latest book. I, I, is that, you think it was that important to include? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yeah. And the reason I, I didn't, the reason I didn't was at the time I was writing the, 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 the uh, the inter the over the outline, it, it it wasn't really ready. Yeah, and I didn't feel that it was seven enough. It was yes. Yeah, it's, it's like, do I put the Excel module in? I mean, a great module, absolutely yeah. outstanding. But yeah. is it PowerShell seven? And and this was in in hindsight, I made a mistake. I should have put this in, but I didn't. But it's a lovely module, and uh, it, it it's uh, yeah, it's great. Uh, the thing about I, that I, I is you don't want to write too much. So then you got another TCP IP book on your hands, right? You got too many pages. Well, <laughs> yeah, it, it depends upon how much they're willing to pay me in advance. But yeah, this is. Sorry, I interrupted this is, your train of thought there. I, well, I, I apologize. Please is, continue. Th this is a fantastic example of that middle ground between PowerShell Core, that, yes. is, the, that is the stuff that Microsoft does. Um, yep. uh, and PowerShell team does from using PowerShell. Mm. And, and I think that like the Excel module, classic examples of doing great things <coughs> without having to have the PowerShell team uh, burdened <coughs> with the cost of yep. maintaining this. Now, yep. you might not know, but I'm a member of the PowerShell command that working group. And it's an open, it's being an open source product, the community has a, a leadership role, and we have a, a few committees that help the, the team decide what to do next. And I'm on the commandment one. And we're always being asked, can you do this? Can you do that? And Jim Schreuer, who, by the way, was the other guy on the stage when Jeffrey Snover did his first talk on Monad, had a funky funky hat. Uh, oh, Jeff, nice. Jeff, Jeff, Jeff keeps, keeps reminding me that, you know, it's, if they take a feature into PowerShell. So let's say, John, you or I write some phenomenal module and now sure. we're pulled into PowerShell. Well, yep. PowerShell now has a technical debt forever for maintaining that. Yes. They've got to add test cases, which slows testing down. They've got to do due diligence because, I mean, I know you and I would never do anything untoward, <laughs> but nope. they don't know that upfront, mm -hmm. a priori. So they've got to check that. 
So taking stuff in is a huge, a huge uh, uh, issue. And I think a lot of people say, well, it's open source, just, just go do it. And I have to say, I'm one of those people who did say, just go do it. Right. And to teach me my lesson, they put me on the committee. <laughs> uh, and and now I'm saying, yeah, but so where we where we where, where this comes around is I think there's a middle ground of really great functionality that the community can develop, whether the community is people at Microsoft or outside. And the secret module, the Excel module are classic yep. examples of that. And then as yep. you but you read in my mind, dude, I was about to say, put the always on the PowerShell gallery. Yep. <laughs> So, I, I, and so, for example, another classic example where I, I'd like it to be taken inside PowerShell is the NTFS security module. Now, I, NTFS security, uh, fantastic. Uh, I could do things like you know, get get and set easily mm. the ACLs on a file or folder. I can I can manage inheritance. This is so much easier the stuff built in. So, for example, if I want to just add an ACE to an ACL, yep, I've yep, got to, yep. natively, I've got to go to .NET and create the ACAE itself using .NET. All right, time out. And I haven't done this yet. I haven't done – I've done DACLs, and I've done DACLs before. I've done all that work before, so I know what you're talking about. So that's 100%. I've never done this in PowerShell. It, am, I, am I right in assuming that this is a nightmare without this module? Well, it's not a nightmare. It's okay. Just, it's just challenging. <laughs> Difficult. It, it, okay. It, it goes back to the ship is to choose. Uh, when the original commandlets were out, can you do everything with the .NET yeah. and commandlets? Yes, the we'll ship. However, okay. is it easy? No, but you can do it. Yes. So, we'll so this makes it super easy, is what you're saying. And and I I I, I use this for all of my ACL settings. So nice. if you if you were to bring that module up, you'd see like I, I can get an, I can get the ACL. I can get uh, if you look at look at look at the down to the bottom of the tutorial. Uh, just so simple. Just the first one there. Uh, it's so simple. Uh, if you have a look down further down, I can do yep. things like um, you know I can get NTFS access, which shows me exactly what the access is. I can then I can then add that. So here you go. Add NTFS access yes. to the path data. There's the account. There's the re, there's the there's the, uh, the 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 access rights. So that in in those three lines, we're adding an ACE to the C call and data for authenticated users. Yep. And I think that's pretty easy to understand. And that's a second one, uh, which is going to built in administrators and Randy, Randy editors, uh, and giving full control. Quite why Randy guys are getting full control, I don't know, but that's another issue. So yeah, again, removing, re removing access, remove NTFS access. So mm. these are really, really good commandments. And I, I'd like them to be inside PowerShell, but I can't justify the cost to the PowerShell team of taking them inside, given it's the maintainer is going to do that. This wasn't part of my original questions that I had written for you for this interview, but I wanted to ask you, since we've, we're on the topic of the PowerShell gallery, um, is there any way, like I know that, uh, so I've done, I've done a lot of things with a lot of different ISVs and I've built extensions and plugins and modules for a variety of other platforms. I'll give you an example, like there's the Terraform registry, which allows you to write okay. providers and there's partner providers and there's other providers that are blessed and they're higher like trust etc yeah. and i know that the powershell got like would and would the ntfs security module for example could could that be blessed and given a higher prominence in the gallery per se like i'm thinking out loud here but you know is that sort of what you guys are thinking in terms of community contributions we've, or? we've stayed away from the blessing. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> Sorry. You know, I, no, 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 no. Domini, domini, domini. We're all Catholic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, any, anybody want to play dominoes? Uh, yeah. But I, I think that to, to bless something sets expectations that are probably inappropriate. Because how okay. can I, as with my PowerShell community uh, committee hat on, how can I know that this guy isn't going to go rogue? Right. How do I know that he won't put a back door in somewhere later down the line? I don't. So unless it's inside where I have absolute control of where I, the PowerShell team, have absolute control over the source code, then 
I don't see how we can bless anything. What we can do, and what we regularly do, is, is things like this. This is a great module. If you need anything to do with NTFS security, there's your go-to. Likewise, yep. Doug Fink's, Doug, Doug Fink's uh, uh, Access uh, Excel. Uh, uh, if, if you're playing with PowerShell and Excel, that's the module. Yep. Now, I like, I like Doug's module as an example. There's no way Excel is ever going to be part of... Um, uh, import Excel, there it is. But there's no way that that module is ever going to go inside PowerShell. It's just, it's just too, it's just too, um, too non-PowerShell. But is it a great module? Yes. If you need PowerShell and Excel, is it the module for you? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this is a great example of where the, the, the gallery adds value around PowerShell. Mm. I, I like to think of I think that this is this is a, a platform for supporting PowerShell, and mm -hmm. that you know that that, that this is the, the foundation that uh, of goodness that you can use once you've started using PowerShell. Yeah, I know that um, with different vendors, I've seen solutions like you know code signatures and agreements and signatures like that, and also you know checking to see if the the uh, module has been tampered on download, things like that. So. Yeah. I'm sure there are technical solutions, but I think you're right. I don't think you, I think you set expectations in, inappropriately and money. Yes, <laughs> I guess that is, that you know, is also know, true. It, if it were me, I would much rather Steve and the PowerShell team do some of the things that I can't talk about, which are on the, on the cards, than bring this module in, uh, adding those new features, fixing some of the issues. Uh, we've got 300, 3000 issues open on commandments. Uh, fixing right. those, I feel, is higher priority than, than than trying to do the blessing. And frankly, the cost of the blessing, I just can't justify it mm. in my mind. I, uh, I, I wasn't planning to ask you about this, but you've got you've captured my interest with this. So, what are like what are you thinking about in terms of make like are you what is what would you say are your top priorities relative to commandlets on as part of this work? I don't know what you call it, working group or you know, well, um, my, my speaking personally, what, one of my big bugbears is compatibility. Okay. Uh, I want to make sure that we're both forward and as much as possible back with compatibility. Um, we're never going to we're never going to get we stop the very short term PowerShell seven introduced into Windows. Hmm. Uh, that the, the support barriers. I'm sure you're I'm sure you're familiar with the issue. The support hmm. barriers. Windows has one support. PowerShell's are different and just they don't marry. And mm. the lawyers haven't found a way around that yet. Hmm. Uh, so we're never going to see PowerShell 7 inside Windows, at least probably no time soon. So how do we make sure that there's good compatibility between the two? So I don't want to put something in that would blow away our backward compatibility if we can avoid it. Right. But that said, uh, Future compatibility, things things like adding the for each parallel, uh, adding the, the the chain operator, those are yep. great ads. Oh, they're yeah, yeah. You know, and I think there's enough of those in the pipeline. Uh, well, the one thing we're going to try and do is we're going to try and get a, a script into Windows called Install PowerShell Seven. Okay. So that that will do. Now, if you look at my uh, my goodie script, you'll see yep. uh, I have scripts there to to to, to, to download. On the PowerShell itself repo is an install PowerShell uh, script. So in my book, I download that and run that. So if you look at, uh, uh, that's it. Uh, look at the first script, chapter one, install PowerShell 7. Yep. So what I do is uh, installing PowerShell 7, the first one. Uh, what I do in the first off is I, I do things like, uh, let's see if I can see this. Uh, yeah, I, I download, uh, in step four, line 20, I download uh, the, uh, the PowerShell install script uh, using the uh, invoke REST method. And then I show that. And then I and then in um, line 29, uh, I create uh, a hash table yep. to then install uh, PowerShell 7 on that machine. Now, I do this manually. What we're going to do is we're going to take those lines of code, well, rather better written, I have to, I have to argue, uh, <laughs> rough, roughly that, that, we're going to take that and put that in install PowerShell 7 code 
Uh, and it, it'll have some other options like de de determining whether to use the MSI, whether right. we have a, a, a preview build or the daily build. <clears throat> so we'll allow someone from Windows, the Windows 11 or Windows Server, <laughs> to them in a blessed fashion, is all PowerShell 7 on that machine. Hmm. So all right. I, I think that's depending a, on where we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, eight eight is a very interesting concept, and it goes back to how we designed PowerShell at the very beginning. Uh, people, I remember time and time again, people say, "Yeah, but I'm on version one of PowerShell." Hmm. No, you're not. If you look at it, uh, it's it's a uh, Windows. Sorry, it's Windows. Uh, System 32, PowerShell mm -hmm. V1. Now, when we did V1 of PowerShell, uh, I was an MVP at the time, uh, mm -hmm. part of the beta team. And uh, Jeff and the other guys were saying, you know, no one's ever done this before. Now, we don't know that when we release PowerShell 1, that someone's going to say, ah, you really should have done it this way. We don't know. We may find after release that we just really messed it up. Yep. And it's just wrong. Well, you know, that's a great uh, that's a great outcome at one level if you can figure out what's right. So what we did was we left the, the, all this V10 stuff, PS1, PSM1, PSD1, V10, and so on, all in there, so that if we had to, there could be a V2. Mm -hmm. So there could be a PowerShell 2 that ran PS2 files, but knew how to run PS1 files. And uh, it, we we worked it so they could all run side by side. That was the theory. Except yep. when PowerShell 2 came out, it was like, yeah, okay, that works. Now more. Yep. And yep. PowerShell 3 came out, and, and then 4, and then 5. And it's like nothing up until that point. Had never been, say never, though. Uh, <laughs> well, absolutely. Ab absolutely. <laughs> so with PowerShell 7 and 7, 1, 2, and 3, and 4, it's just been incremental improvements. Mm. Um, yeah, I know that that, that said, story is tough. That, 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 that backwards compatibility story is always a gnarly one. That's why Semver is awesome. Like if you're doing semantic versioning, like you guys, like if you're, if you're doing with uh, version one to seven, you know, and, and you say, okay, breaking changes are part of the deal. Then I think that everyone will buy into that contract. Sorry, I interrupted. Please continue. Yeah. There's a balance. There's a balance to be struck. Not everybody is going to be happy with having to go back. No, of course not. The scripts. So no. I, I, I want to make sure that, there's no debt incurred by these future things. Uh, I, I don't want you to have to say, well, I want 7.5, but I got to go fix all my 7.0 scripts. That yep. doesn't strike me. Now, if we have a set of features that are so compelling, and by the way, I haven't seen them yet, but I'm <laughs> open to them. Yep. Right? If you find that they're so compelling that it's going to break, then mm -hmm. yeah, okay, we can go to PS2. Yep. I wouldn't want to. There's a lot of complexity in that. And I don't know. We haven't tried it. I don't know mm. what the ramifications are going to be. So there's a, a deep technical risk. But it's something which, if there's a feature that's that important, then sure, we'll look at it. Absolutely. Yep. So we talked I, uh, a little bit one. about... <laughs> so we, we, we started this whole like tangent by talking about the what is your favorite feature. Um, I'm curious to know if you think there's anything that's... Well, I'm sure there's everything that's missing. But again, I, I don't know if this is a softball or not, but are there any features that you think are missing that you would like to see added? Now, given the fact that you're working on the, the commandlet story, et cetera, and the community story, um, I'm sure there's a number of candidates. You've already mentioned, you know, for example, the the ability to work with Excel files and DACLs and NTFS, et cetera. But at the language level or, or in the environment or anything like that, does anything kind of, is there anything uh, percolate to the top for you? You know, I've been using Windows PowerShell so long, I've gotten used to what I can do. And I find it's kind of like going from a Ford Escort into, I don't know, a, 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 a Volkswagen Golf. Okay. Like, it, 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 it's faster, it's better, it's bigger, it's more yes. comfortable. Uh, could I go for a Lamborghini? Sure. Sure. But, <laughs> so for me, I don't, I don't, I can get around, I can do anything I need to do. So I think like the chain operator, I didn't need the chain operator. Sure. I mean, it, PowerShell, I worked fine for five generations in PowerShell without needing it. I have no Unix background, to be fair, and no yes. Mac background, to be equally fair. But so what we're doing now is adding, it feels to me like nice to have. Yes. 
And and the thing is that so many and 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 also the other thing that we're knocking our hands against are some of the the the, the limitations of what we did in V1 and V2. Hmm. In particular, the file system provider. Oh boy, that could be so much better. Hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just there's so many little inconsistencies that if they work, it, it can be made to made to made to function, but you know, just wiping that away, starting from scratch. But that really would need a whole new provider model, probably. Yeah. Uh, so that's one. The formatting. Oh, geez. Hmm. The formatting system is just nobody understands it internally. I, I, <laughs> that's you're not you, you're not that is, Windows is not unique in that in that problem space. By the way, I'll just say that. So. I mean, I, I've looked at the code for of uh, you know the formatting command list, and whoosh, I yeah. I can't even get close to understanding what's going on. Yeah. And uh, I I. I've tried for 10 years to figure out format custom and I still can't do it. Mm. Uh, so there are things like that that could use a rehash. And for those, you know, if we had a V2 as in PowerShell eight, then a new right. formatting subsystem, a new, a new provider module. Uh, I mean, the, the provider module did a lot, the module uh, the model did a lot of good, but I can't really say that file system provider is fast. Mm. It's just the nature of having an extra layer there. So there are things that we could do to make PowerShell much, much better that would be completely incompatible backwards. That I've been willing to think about a B2, but so far I haven't seen enough need, demonstrable need, that that to make the, the, the expense and the, and to to manage the risk sufficiently. Mm. I I'm willing to listen. Um, given your experience with PowerShell, given your experience with PowerShell, and obviously running these in an admin perspective and teaching others how to do this, such, um, I'm I'm curious to know. Like, obviously, I'm assuming you're a fan of of Windows Terminal and the fact that that's also another open source project, and you've got all the source code for console and and the command prompt and Windows Terminal sitting in one repository now. Well, console.dll was really a pretty challenged product back in <laughs> 1990. I mean, it was rocking. It Come on. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Maybe in 1990 it rocked, but, you know, in yeah. it was getting old. <laughs> and so so the terminal is lovely. I I, uh, I moved from, the in the second of the, my books, I moved from using uh, the, the normal console and ISC to using Windows Terminal personally. Yeah. I love it. The well, I really love all the goodness that's in that terminal window to be in the terminal in VS Code. Mm. Yeah, see what I mean. That's a good suggestion. And, and uh, uh, I've 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 offered it several times. It's it's on mm. the issue list. Uh, it'll never happen, but but I love both products, and so I use them interchangeably. Yeah. Are you are do you um do you find that the the admins that you talk to when when talking to them about PowerShell are using also sub subsystem for Linux, etc. Are like do they have a need to do okay. that at all? So for me, and this is mm. this is I'm not going to generalize. For me, no. Uh, okay. I very few of the people that I I taught over my time were much into Linux. Yeah, uh, there was some. Uh, sorry for that, but uh, you know uh, WSL. It did, when I was teaching regularly, it was 1.0, and that wasn't really ready for prime time. But mm. with 2.0, if I was doing it today, yeah, I'd be, I'd be talking about that. And I think if I was teaching heavily today, I'd be investing in learning a bit more about Linux. Right, uh, right. I really like your suggestion now that I've thought about it a little bit, the, the integration of the Windows terminal into VS Code. The only thing that I think about there is, you know, VS Code is a heavily multi-platform product, obviously. And so now you're creating SKUs of, you know, the terminal window. And I would imagine people running Mac and Linux, I being one of them, <laughs> would well, be like, no, we we want an awesome terminal experience too. Now you get this, you get this whole like, well, why do they uh, get it? You know? <laughs> well, and there, there's one small problem with, with that integration, uh, which is one product is written using C++, the other is using Node.js. And uh, <laughs> it's never going to fit. You have to do a complete it, rewrite. It can, it, 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 I've seen I've seen nah, some nah, some interesting work. Nah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I I think I think the terminal team have more uh, more self respect. Yeah, yeah. Um, th just getting st sticking with just VS Code for a second. I mean, I obviously you know one of the the extensibility of VS Code obviously is probably the most powerful aspect of VS Code. Not yeah, not absolutely, just absolutely. You know, 
the fact that it's super fast and all that sort of thing. And that's part of the reason why I think that it's been so successful. Um, the PowerShell integration there, the fact that you can get it integrated, you get the preview. Um, people are writing also um, other types of packages, extensions for PowerShell. Is that a vibrant ecosystem? Like, has the PowerShell oh, community yeah. really gravitated to VS Code well, in a big way? I certainly in all the training I did for the last last five years, I've used VS Code. I've yeah. said, look, you can use the IC. Here it is. It's lovely, but let's look at VS. This is the future. And uh, probably a third of my students were converted during the course, you know, and, and went home. And I've heard stories that they're now happy with it. But as it's gotten better and better, it's like you know, the ISC only does Windows PowerShell 5 and yep. end of story. Uh, now, is it, is it a good ecosystem? Sure. <coughs> the ISC was wonderful, but it's dated. Mm. And I, I <coughs> when I go back on a, on a to, to using it, it's like, God, this feels so old. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and that's interesting now because like, VS Code is a developer tool, right? So this is where it gets really interesting. Again, like most people who use PowerShell, and not, I'm not saying like it's everyone, but most people who use PowerShell are not developers. Like they're they're admins. Like they're they're managing they're managing servers, they're managing resources, etc. And so it's a it's an interesting kind of blend there of of user roles. Now you've got admins, IT pros, whatever you want to call them, with developers, and then the whole conversation of like, okay using source control for your scripts. And like we, we've mentioned GitHub a few times in this, in this call already. Um, is that something that you're talking to students about? Like, are, is it, do you have to now educate them about Git and GitOps and well, how to, you know, use all that stuff? When we start the course, uh, I always made the point that PowerShell does a lot. Windows PowerShell does, did a lot, but yeah. we needed more. And that there was this ecosystem out there. And I showed them things like NTFS. Uh, access. I show them um, uh, other uh, fun things, uh, and you know, get them to explore the PowerShell gallery because I think there's a there's a tremendous amount of goodness in the gallery if you can find. Oh it. yeah, yeah, hundred uh, percent. Now, Jeff Hicks is doing a marvelous job of writing scripts to produce uh, uh, statistics out of the gallery. Uh, if you can find, I don't know if you can find him, but. Uh, so, yeah, so we look at the top packages downloaded. That's great. Uh, and you can see there's some pretty interesting ones. PS Windows Update. Again, I use that a lot. Uh, the, the Azure the Azure stuff, hundreds of Azure, uh, well, thousands of Azure commandments. Mm. Uh, so you can do anything you want to do. PowerShell Get. Uh, so those are, those are some great. But Jeff Hicks somewhere, I don't, don't remember where, produces a bunch of statistics about what's new and what's exciting and so on trying yep. to get more uh, we, we need to do a better job of publishing pushing the gallery right yeah so maybe that's something that could surface its way out I mean there there are there are commandlets that you can run within PowerShell to grab these things obviously oh, and yeah. install them and all that yeah. sort of stuff but maybe it's just one, maybe it's just yeah mod sorry module I misspoke so um and then inside the commandlets obviously you could run etc um, I'm just curious like there might be there, there might be a happy medium there where you're trying to appeal to the developer audience, right? That's my audience. That's, that's where I'm, that's my background. Um, you know, the, the admins, the, the sys admins, they're, they're, they're a different, they're a different, uh, type of kettle of fish for me. Cause, uh, they, they have to deal with really gnarly problems that we don't have to deal with on the software side, like permissions Indeed. and, um, you know, auditing Firewalls. and yeah, all those things <laughs> that we don't worry about. We're just, we're going to assume we're running as admin and we'll just go from there, you know? So, um, that's great. So, um, is there, uh, so are you part of the crew looking over the gallery? No. Okay. No, no, I'm just, I'm just a happy user. The, 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 in the command that working group, what we're trying to do is to close down issues, which can be solved with a community module. And we're basically saying, look, that's a great idea. It belongs in the PowerShell ecosystem. It's just, we don't think that the PowerShell core team is the right place to do that. It, it's up, up for grabs. Please do it. And we open that we open the door a little bit to say that if there's something that's so great that really needs to be into PowerShell, prove it in the gallery and we'll look at it. Now, I don't think we've done anything to pull anything from the gallery into PowerShell itself yet. 
but there's no no reason why we couldn't. There you go, the working groups. I'm not sure how up to date that is. Uh, further <laughs> down is the commandment. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Doctor DNS. There I go. Yeah. <laughs> so you got a bunch of people there who we're all trying to. Uh, yeah, I mean, so if you if you look at the, the sub modules, the ship is part of PowerShell package or managed by other sources. That's that's a that's a, a challenge. Mm. So we uh, so we're, we're always trying to balance off because, for example, PS read line, completely different repo. We ship it, but it's not our bug. If you see what I mean. Yes. So we're I constantly do. having to triage that where you see a bug in PowerShell. It's actually a bug not in PowerShell, but in PS read line or in PowerShell get or in thread job or archive. So those need to go to the right repo. And so part of our job is to push those in the right direction. But we also want to make sure that if there are great ideas that we can implement, then bring them in. Uh, again, subject to the, the, the obvious issues, um, I'm, I'm happy to look at adding to PowerShell, but we need to be cognizant of the costs. So just getting back to the book quickly, the book is Windows Server Automation with PowerShell Cookbook. Yes. This is the fifth edition, the first one being written in 2013. There's lots of stuff to check out there. If you're at all interested, it's available up on Amazon as both an ebook and Kindle and paperback. It's over 700 pages, so you're getting your value for money. Uh, and I would imagine other than obviously the, uh, <laughs> yes, there it is. And obviously other than the, um, the TCP, IP, the TCP IP book, this is probably a good value, value for money. It's a good stocking stuffer for any sysadmin you have on your list. Absolutely. Um, anything, anything else you want to mention about the book? Uh, no, I, 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 other than the fact that the scripts are all up on GitHub, um, I think they all work, but, uh, uh, errors and omissions accepted. Uh, uh, let me know. File issues if you find an issue, and uh, keep up the conversation. I'm on. I'm on uh, both Mastodon and uh, on um, what's the, what's that other place? The bird place. Uh, Twitter. Uh, Twitter. <laughs> uh, uh, That's right. My handle on both is Doctor DNS. And there you're you probably wondering. Well, yeah, there you go. That's me. And you're yeah. probably wondering why Doctor DNS. I, I have a suspicion because if it isn't DNS, it's it's DNS is always the problem. Well, with DNS seems actually, no. I, many years ago, I got a got a call from a buddy working on the on the doc team saying, "But well, I want to come and do some work writing the documentation for what would be the Windows Server 2003 resource kit." Okay, now, that was never published due to internal issues. But I wrote four chapters in at Redmond, and um. As I was finishing off my work, do you remember the, the I love you virus? Oh, yeah. God, yeah. <laughs> so I was in building 41, and that was the week that the I love you virus hit. Oh, man. <laughs> so so on the Thursday, uh, we can't do nothing because email's down. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, I'm wandering the halls, and people are saying, email is my job. Uh, so on the Friday, I'm sitting there. Getting ready that night, I'm going back back to London, I'm tidying up, and I get an email from one of the team who'd gone to work for Google, and he said, "Hey, would you like a uh, a Google address? We're still in beta, but sure, sure, sure." So I I I said, "Yes, please." So he sent me an invite, and Thomas Lee, TFL, T Lee, all the ones were taken. So I'm looking down at my desk, and we had a little project in what became Windows Server 2003. The code name was Doctor DNS. Perfect. And the idea and the idea was to fix a lot of little problems we we created in the DNS server in 2000 to make life okay. easier. Yeah. So this was just to solve all these. You know, we chose, we didn't chose well, and we can fix it. So I, I thought, well, Doctor DNS. I said sold. <laughs> well, so that was the Friday afternoon, and I didn't get my invite uh, processed until I got back to London. And anyway, so I, I read some email and I get some invites to hand out. And one of the one of the, the product managers came, how can you call me yourself Dr. DNS? That's a my, my name. So I've been Dr. DNS ever since. <laughs> and twenty and, and twenty years later, we still wrestle with DNS. It's unbelievable. We've gone to cloud and everything's amazing. And we've got Azure and we've got all these great systems in place, and we still it's have problems. With, yeah, it's always DNS. 
I think that's a great place. Still DNS. <laughs> but every time we have a problem here uh, at, at home in my little 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 uh, uh, network, my wife says, "Oh, it's DNS again, isn't it?" Yep. Yeah, you would have guessed right. Yep, that's right. Oh, Thomas, I okay. could go. I could talk to you for two hours, like for twelve hours at this point. Um, but we got to wrap it up there. I I really you. appreciate your time. Thank you for talking to me about PowerShell. And uh, yeah, um, uh, we'll see you at PowerShell Eight, I guess. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if and when that ever uh, uh, that ever. You shifts. know, uh, I, I'm 72 years old, and I'm open for anything. So bring it on. And <laughs> thanks, John, for your time. You. Appreciate your questions. All right. Cheers.